right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Anderson House here in Washington, D.C. My name is Andrew Allen, and I'm the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence, fulfilling the aim of the Continental Army officers who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory of that vast event. In addition to this evening's program, the Institute fulfills that mission by supporting advanced study, developing exhibitions and other historical programs and tours, advocating historical preservation, and providing resources to classrooms nationwide that benefit teachers, students, and scholars alike. Since, since 1938, the Society of the Cincinnati has done all of this work from its headquarters right here at Anderson House, a national historic landmark that was completed in 1905 as the winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson. Tonight's lecture, a program that is made possible in part by a generous gift from the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati, features Dr. David Shung dis discussing environmental legacies, how the War of Independence affected the natural world in predictable and surprising ways. When one considers the effects of war on the environment, their thoughts probably turn to modern events such as the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki or the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam. The American Revolution, however, also had a major impact on the natural world in the 18th century. Tonight, through an examination of events throughout the conflict, Dr. Shung offers a fresh way of thinking about the war and its legacy, but also a new perspective on war in general and its environmental impact. David Shung is a is professor of history at Junietta College in Pennsylvania. He earned his PhD in history from the U University of Michigan, uh, named Professor of the Year for Pennsylvania in 2000 by the Carnegie, the, by the Car, excuse me, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. Dr. Shung has published several works, including the books Two Worlds in the Tennessee Mountains, Exploring the Origins of Appalachian Stereotypes, published by the Universe, Ver, University Press of Kentucky in 1997, and A Mountaineer in Motion, the memoir of Dr. Abraham Job. 1817 to 1906, published by the University of Tennessee Press in 2009, and the article in the New, New England Quarterly, Food, Fuel, and the New England Environment in the War of Independence, 1775 through 1776, that was awarded the Theodore C. Bludgeon Award from the Forest History Society in 2008. Currently, he is working on a book that examines the vir environmental history of the War of Independence, a topic he has spoken about at several recent conferences, including the FOR 2026 conference hosted by the Omohandro Institute, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Now, as always, before I turn things over to Dr. Shung, however, there are a few housekeeping items to cover for those of you tuning in with us on Zoom this evening. Following tonight's lecture, there will be a question and answer session, so feel free to submit your questions at any time during the lecture, and we will do our best to incorporate them with our live audience questions. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted using the chat function, as one of our staff members will be monitoring that and will do their best to assist you. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming to Anderson House, Dr. David Shaw. Thank you, Andrew. Um, maybe we should do a sound check first. Folks here in, uh, in the audience, you can hear me? Okay, and Zoomers, I hope you can hear me. If you, if you can't, send a little uh, a message in the, in the chat or the um, Q&A, okay? And Andrew will work his magic to, so that you can hear me. Okay. Uh, I wanna thank the folks at uh, Anderson House for um, setting all of this up. Uh, it's, it's terrific. I know it involves a lot of work. If you just look at the, the power strip over there and all the cords plugged into the wall there, uh, this was not done at the last minute. I'd like to thank the American Revolution Institute and the Society, for the, of, the, the Society of the Cincinnati. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming out uh, on a winter evening. And I'd like to thank you Zoomers for uh, uh, coming in and from all points of the compass. Uh, I hope you have your feet up and uh, a glass of uh, something warm close at hand. Thank you everyone. All right, so let me start by asking you to think about two words, environment and war. 
how do how do they affect each other? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you folks, though those of you in front of me, what do you think? Come on in, and I'm gonna ask Zoomers uh, if you have ideas. I I can't see your comments, but maybe you can have a uh, discussion among yourselves, and uh, one person's ideas can can uh, uh, generate other ideas among the cyber audience there. Okay, so um, maybe we think about the environment's effect on war. Do any examples come to mind? Weather. Yeah, d does, a particular, uh, uh, does a particular example of weather affecting war or combat come to mind? Okay, um, uh, Napoleon and the Russian winter. Okay, anything else? And and the environments of the Russo-Finnish War. Okay. All right. Uh, I was thinking about um, D-Day and how the storms in the English Channel delayed uh, and almost canceled the invasion of Normandy. You might think about the jungles of Vietnam the deserts of Iraq, the mountains of Afghanistan. Okay. What about closer to our time period, the American Revolution? Do you have any thoughts about environments effect on the War of Independence? Valley Forge, okay, the, the cold winters there, right? Zoomers, I hope you're typing away and sharing ideas. Ah, oh, the fog, the providential fog of, of to, to cover Washington's um, evacuation. Right, terrific. I was thinking about uh, the ice-choked Delaware River uh, Christmas uh, on the way to uh, Trenton. Okay. Now, what if we flip the words around? The war's effect on the environment. Anything come to mind? Destruction of, exactly. You think, you think about um, the, not only, I think we get pictures most often of infrastructure destroyed. So what's gonna happen with all that rubble? What happens with all of the liquids that get like uh, uh, blown out of pipes? I don't know if you remember, but early in the war, um, I think it was near Kiev, they purposely flooded fields to slow down the, the Russian advance, right? And uh, who knows what might happen with the, um, the nuclear power plants in Ukraine and the missile attacks and the drone attacks, okay? So my research looks at the connections <clears throat> between environment and war. I'm studying the American Revolution and environmental history. And by environmental history, I mean the, the humans and the natural world interacting with each other, affecting each other in an ongoing dynamic kind of relationship. And for nearly 250 years, historians have tried to figure out the American Revolution, try to understand the American Revolution. Typically, they look at the political or economic or social or cultural spheres of human activity. What I'm trying to add to this incredible mountain of scholarship, of terrific scholarship, is humans' interactions with the environment and paying special attention to what the sciences might help us see. Biology, botany, geology, ecology, and the like. Okay, so my approach is to be is to look first at energy. All living organisms need energy, right? Um, and uh, we need that energy to keep our metabolisms going. Now we can go uh, expand from the organism level or the individual level to uh, larger communities, 
Uh, people have, sociologists talk about cities having a metabolism. Electricity, natural gas goes into a, into a city, provides energy. Sewage systems remove wastes, okay? So um, I think this can be extended to the revolution, and I'm looking at how armed forces use uh, and need energy. And we, we can call this military metabolism, okay? They, uh, armed forces need energy like what? Food, anything else? Fuel, most likely in the form of firewood. Yep, Canada provided some coal uh, not much and not for very long, but mostly firewood. Anything else? Horse feed. Yeah. Okay, you, you, you went to level two already. Level one is they need work animals. They need oxen, they need horses, they need uh, animals to, to be able to move. And then those animals need food as well. You need water. Um, I'm adding in ammunition as, as well, okay? Um, all of this energy comes from the environment. And so I'm working on a book that's looking at a few, a few different questions. How did these armed forces acquire and use energy? Mm -hmm. How did acquiring and using that energy shape the course of the war? Did it uh, affect operations, strategy? And then how did the acquisition and use of that energy affect environments, short-term, long-term, environments close by and far away and distant? Okay. I think uh, we're gonna focus on environments, uh, war's effects on the environments. I think you'll find some of those effects pretty predictable but I, others, I hope, might surprise you and get you thinking differently about the effects and costs of war. Let me uh, start off by, by looking at winter encampments. The most famous of these was at Valley Forge that uh, the gentleman in the back mentioned. Here is the, a map of the Middle Atlantic campaign in 1777. By the end of that campaign season, September, October, 1777, British and Germans were in Philadelphia. Continental Congress was on the run and Washington and the main part, the main body of the Continental Army was in Valley Forge, which was about 20 miles away to the Northwest. Uh, have any of you been to Valley Forge? Okay, a few hands. I, I hope some of you on Zoom have been uh, to Valley Forge as well. It's a National Historic Park uh, today. Washington chose Valley Forge in part because he wanted to be close enough to Philadelphia to keep an eye on the enemy, but far enough away to be relatively safe. He also decided not to billet the men in existing housing houses, structures in towns scattered around the countryside. He thought that would uh, weaken his force, make him more vulnerable. So he said, we're going to build our own housing in Valley Forge. Now they got to work um, on uh, in December 19, uh, 1777. Here is a photo of replica huts at Valley Forge National Historic Park. At the time, there were 15, 16,000 or so uh, continental soldiers. And that group uh, collected together was the equivalent of the third largest city in North America at the time. Okay? They built huts. Each hut was roughly 18 feet long, 16 feet wide, six feet high at the eaves. So for those of you here in this grand space, about 18 feet wide is from one end of the chairs to the other end in one row. 
that's like 17 and a half feet. And the width of the hut was from the front row to about the lectern. Okay, so imagine a rectangle that size and imagine like 12 uh, regular soldiers in a hut like that. You thought your your rooms at uh, Juniata were were kind of tight, or the, the, the rooms at, at where where you went to went to college, twelve in a space like that. Okay, um, John Todd Jr. of Connecticut said that constructing the huts had been uh, had been difficult. The whole of it was made with one poor axe and no other tool. And we were not more than a fortnight, a fortnight is two weeks, right? Not more than a fortnight in building of it, although never more than three men worked at once. Okay? There was some motivation to get these huts built, right? It's, it's late December. The roof, he said, was made of uh, split slabs covered with turf and earth that kind of leaked when it was wet, but when it was dry, it was pretty good. Okay. In total, the soldiers built over the course of their time at Valley Forge about 1,500 huts. Okay. Now, how much wood did they cut down in Valley Forge? Um, the uh, the uh, a ranger at the Valley Forge National Historic Park estimated that to build the huts, it required over 127,000 trees between three and 12 inches in diameter. 12 inches, a little more than, you know, your standard uh, piece of copier paper. That's a pretty good size tree, 127,000. Hmm. They also needed, as you said, firewood to stay warm, okay? Uh, the National Park Service estimated that uh, you needed 10 cords of wood per hut for the six months they were at Valley Forge. Okay, so 1,500 huts means 15,000 cords of wood. And a cord of wood is a stack that's four feet high, four feet deep, eight feet long. Okay, um, one set of chair, five chairs here is seven and a half feet. Okay, so pile of uh, a cord is that size, size come out four feet. Okay, in other words, 15,000 cords is a pile of wood stacked chest high of, of uh, covering more than eight football fields. All right, so this demand. Uh, uh, for wood uh, led to the destruction of lot, lots of local forests and woodlands. Okay? Probably every tree in a three mile radius of Valley Forge, of the encampment. Okay? For those of you who know uh, the layout of DC, the red pin there is Anderson House. Okay? And if you go three miles to the Northwest, you get to American University. And if you go three miles to the southeast, you get a little beyond the U.S. Capitol. Okay, so imagine spinning those arms like a clock face, uh, make a big circle, a three mile radius covers a lot of the D.C. area. No trees, imagine that. Okay, now, what might you expect some of the environmental effects to be of this kind of deforestation? And Zoomers, you can uh, type among yourselves. Deforestation like this might lead to erosion, no more roots holding the soil. And that erosion, that soil goes where? Into the water. So you get siltation of water, waterways, of, of lakes. Anything else? Yeah. It's tough being a squirrel if there are no trees in a three mile radius, right? Right, okay, so yeah, flooding, uh, flooding, erosion, habitat loss. Um, 
without trees, the ground in the winter uh, freezes more quickly and freezes more deeply. In the summer, without trees, the ground, the soil dries out more quickly than uh, in a forested area. Predictable stuff. Now, you might be surprised to learn that deforestation can even disrupt the local weather, making rainfall more erratic. Uh, how that works will take some explanation. We can save that for Q&A. Okay. What about longer term environmental change? The effects, say, over the span of decades, does anything come to mind? Pardon me? No old growth, and in place of the old growth is new growth, right? The succession of species, okay? Terrific. Um, at the time in 1777, there were a lot of uh, white oaks in Valley Forge. Terrific firewood. Okay? 40 years later, uh, the new growth were different species, okay? Hickories, chestnuts, and black oaks. And chestnuts and black oaks are much poorer as firewood. They contain more moisture and, and, and whatever, okay? So high fuel value trees were now replaced by lower fuel value trees. And local residents knew that this process would continue. Isaac Wayne is in the area in, in 1814, and he's writing about Valley Forge. The farmers in many parts of this county are so decidedly convinced of the change of timber, the succession of species, that they reluctantly cut their full grown white oak, black oak, and hickory, knowing that these species will be succeeded by some other of a quality inferior for fuel. I was so happy when I found this uh, quotation. I was like, yes, yes, this is, this is evidence. So the residents of Valley Forge had to chop down many more chestnuts and black oaks compared to the number of white oaks they had cut down earlier just to stay as warm to maintain their metabolisms at the same levels as they had previously. So clear cutting in 1777 led to continuous deforestation in the decades that followed. Okay. Now in uh, the, 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 con the main Continental Army under Washington left Valley Forge in June, 1778. And in August, 1778, there was some um, military action in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, the British who were occupying Newport repelled an attack by the French Navy and a different uh, wing of the Continental Army. They repelled this attack, but they felt they needed greater security and they felt they needed uh, provisions, they needed supplies. Uh, the victualling ships coming from Great Britain were late and the supplies, the main stores in New York City were running low, okay? So we need uh, uh, to strengthen the security and get more uh, energy. So the commanders in New York City sent Major General Charles Gray to the Massachusetts coast with over 4,000 men, 20 transports escorted by 11 ships of war, okay? September 1778, they hit the uh, coast of Massachusetts. Buzzards Bay is that armpit of Massachusetts. If, if Cape Cod is that arm sticking out, Buzzards Bay is the armpit. And in September 5, uh, Gray and his uh, forces um, attack New Bedford, uh, Fairhaven, Falmouth and some other towns. Okay. Gray reported that they had destroyed over 70 vessels besides, quote, whale boats and others. And they burned dozens of storehouses filled with, as he reported, 
very great quantities of rum, sugar, molasses, coffee, tobacco, cotton, tea, medicines, gunpowder, sailcloth, cordage, and more. Okay, uh, materials that uh, might, uh, by destroying these materials, it might dampen some of the uh, rebellious attitudes in this, in this colony. Then on September 10th, they moved to uh, Martha's Vineyard, that island just off the coast uh, uh, from Buzzards Bay. Okay? They destroyed a couple of dozen more vessels. They leveled the salt works there, but they also showed some restraint. According to Lieutenant John Peebles, the residents were told to get what stock of cattle and sheep was intended for the French fleet, which if they would drive down to the shore and bring in their arms, for they register here 500 militia, they would not be molested. So the residents brought in 388 muskets, turned them over. They brought in the public money tax revenue, cut running to a thousand pounds. They drove down 300 cattle and 10,000 sheep, right? 10,000 sheep for, uh, in a pretty, uh, pretty small uh, location. Martha's Vineyard there is 87 square miles. And if you take uh, the size of the District of Columbia and you add in the city of Alexandria, that's 80, about 87 uh, square miles, 10,000 sheep. It took 20 vessels, especially brought in from Rhode Island, and it took four days of work from all those soldiers just to load up all of those animals. Okay. 10,000 sheep. You can tell I, 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 I still can't get over it. It's, it's an eye-popping number, at least to someone who grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, where there were zero sheep. Okay. What might be some of the environmental effects of removing 10,000 sheep from an island ecosystem? Zoomers, you can, any ideas? Uh, I heard something over here. The grass would grow because sheep are great at cropping the, the grasses. Yeah. Okay, so there'll be uh, uh, plant succession too. If, if certain uh, species are allowed to grow, they're gonna be uh, different plants, okay? Yes, uh, there have been uh, scientific studies of other islands like in California where sheep have been removed and uh, white-tailed deer do well, small mammals like uh, voles and shrews like higher grasses. There's like more protection from predators. Um, there uh, slight changes in the habitat. Okay. But at Martha's Vineyard, they didn't do so well for so long. Okay. There was a traveler to Martha's Vineyard, James Freeman, who, who visited the island in 1807, about 30 years after the attack. Okay. He said that there were, at that time, 2,800 oxen, and he calculated that there were 15,600 sheep on Martha's Vineyard. And so he said, the cattle and sheep have indeed been restored to their former numbers. But what Freeman wrote next surprised me. The cattle and the sheep populations had rebounded but the whale fishery has entirely ceased and the cod fishery has hardly begun to revive. I was so wrapped up in those sheep that I overlooked or just skimmed over the 100 or more vessels that the British forces either destroyed or captured. And including, included in those 100 vessels were whale ships. In the five years before the war started, 
the five busiest ports in Massachusetts annually sent out an average of 172 fishing vessels into the North Atlantic. That number took a nosedive with the start of the war. Okay? Uh, not just the destruction of whale boats and other ships, but the British Navy attacked American shipping, attacked neutral shipping. So what whale whaler is going to put whale oil on these transports in order to let the uh, British uh, sink those ships. Also, American mariners either fought as privateers attacking British transports, or they signed up for the militia or they joined the Continental Army. So there was a labor shortage of whalemen. And then once the War of Independence ended, the wars between Britain and France uh, from 1792 to 1815 started up and further suppressed whaling. In the summer of 1807, for example, when James Freeman was walking around Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, which is the next island to the east of Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket had sent out 120 vessels, but only 41 of them were uh, whaling, and none of them sailed in the North Atlantic. They went to the Pacific or somewhere else. Okay, so one of the consequences of war is more whales. What might be the, the ripple effects of having more whales in the North Atlantic? Zoomers, put, you, put on your thinking caps. Less prey. Because uh, whales, whales like lobster. They, they crack those claws and get those little, you're, you're on the right track. Um, a, a, a bowhead whale, oops, uh-oh, yeah, uh, that was a bowhead whale at night. Now here, here's, a, here's a bowhead whale. Bowhead whale eats annually maybe 100 metric tons of tiny crustaceans. I think, I think, uh, so you're uh, uh, not lobsters, but they eat a lot of stuff. And there, and therefore that means there's less food available for other species, right? That's a consequence. Turns out though, whales also uh, by their actions provide nutrients and um, um, important food items for, for the species. By their diving and surfacing, they stir up the water column and nutrients that are at the lower levels of the, of the ocean um, get, get brought up to the surface where there are other kinds of creatures there. Also, if you eat 100 metric tons of food a year, what do you also do? You, yeah, you poop and pee a lot, right? And that, that uh, uh, whale waste provides a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and iron that plankton and krill use. Okay? In the longer term, this period of recovery from the War of Independence through the Napoleonic Wars, or the War of 1812, set the stage for what some historians have called the golden age of whaling. 1815 to the 1850s, where whale, whale products, whale oil uh, transformed uh, a lot of Western societies. So the lesson, I think, for us is to think of, again about war's effects on the environment. We, we mentioned destruction, okay? And uh, you can certainly think of many more examples than just uh, the Ukraine about, um, about how war has destroyed the environment. But Martha's Vineyard shows us that um, war can also be good for species, good in terms of population numbers or uh, the, the, the diversity of species. When humans are killing each other, other species can, can benefit. Okay. Now let me finish with um, 
a different byproduct of metabolisms. Uh, whale metabolisms produce poop and pee and carbon dioxide and all that. What I'd like to focus on is hazardous waste. Okay. During revolutionary battles, soldiers fired lead musket balls, and no one went around the battlefield afterwards picking up those musket balls. No one remediated the battlefield. And we all know that lead in the environment is bad, right? It, how is it bad? Mm -hmm. Toxic, people can die. That's bad. If what? Okay, um, lead particles get into the water. We drink the water that gets in our bodies. We can die. We can suffer uh, neural nerve nerve system damage, uh, especially uh, uh, babies and uh, young kids are susceptible to to the effects of lead. So it's it's bad. So I thought, well, how much lead is out there in a battle? So I chose the battles of Saratoga. This is upstate New York. The battles took place north of Albany, September 19 and October 7, 1777. How much lead was deposited there? Here are my armchair calculations. Okay. First of all, we need to know how many soldiers took part in the battle. So here are the numbers. There were more soldiers on both sides, but they didn't necessarily see battle on those two days. Okay. Then we got to think about the ammunition. Okay. Both sides used a musket that fired a 75 caliber lead musket ball. And those musket balls weigh one ounce. Okay. Americans added a few buckshot into the muzzles and call that 0.2 of an ounce. Okay. Now, how much ammunition did those soldiers carry with them? Americans had cartridge boxes that carried 30 rounds, British and Germans, 60 rounds. Okay. Now, I started off by assuming that every soldier present fired his full supply of ammunition. Okay. That's possible. It might be, it, it might be um, unrealistic, but it's possible because there were numerous accounts that described the fighting as intense and continuous, lasting four hours on September 19, lasting at least three and a half hours on October 7. So uh, you take the, the number of soldiers, uh, the weight of the musket ball or the buckshot, how much uh, they had in their cartridge boxes, you multiply that out. Americans maybe uh, shot nearly 370,000 ounces of lead. British and Germans, 356,000 ounces. The total is there at the bottom. Near over 22 tons of lead. Heavy fighting, right? Now, modern medical and scientific studies look at lead, not just what's the, the gross weight of the lead sitting there in the environment, but they look at lead in terms of concentrations, milligram to kilogram or parts per million. So I had to put this 22 tons of lead into an amount of soil. Because when they, you know, some lead musket balls went into uh, Benedict Arnold's leg, Benedict Arnold's leg, right? Ham Hamilton's leg, Arnold's leg, Arnold's leg, right? But a lot of those musket balls went into trees or uh, into the ground. So I needed to get a quantity of soil. So I armchair calculation estimated that the size of the battlefield is about 250 acres. Okay. Now, I, th I thought uh, this soil in upstate New York is Hudson and Rhinebeck silt loam. A cubic foot of that soil is 105 pounds. 
Okay. Size of the battlefield is 250 acres. So I thought, why don't I take a four inch slice of the battlefield, like a huge sheet cake, because a musket ball isn't going to penetrate beyond four inches of the soil, probably not beyond the first inch or two, but I thought I'll, I'll take four inches to be conservative, okay? A four inch, 253 acre sheet cake of Hudson and Rhinebeck silt loam weighs a lot, 380 million pounds. Now that soil has a natural concentration of lead, 15 to 40 parts per million. And if you take the 22 tons, 381 million pounds of soil, turn everything into metric, you get a concentration of lead after the battles of 119 milligrams to kilogram parts per million, a three to eight times eightfold increase in the natural concentration. Now, maybe I should make a more conservative calculation. Maybe not every soldier fired his weapon or fired all of his rounds. So I arbitrarily took 25% off the top and you get a concentration of 89.3 parts per million, still a two to six fold increase in the, in the lead. That's bad, right? It's bad if the lead gets into the groundwater and we drink it. It's bad if tiny particles pass through our skin. Um, it's bad if we eat food with lead particles in it and, and swallow it. Okay. Um, that was my original thinking. I had originally stopped there, but the environmental side of environmental history led me to ask further questions. How do the lead particles get formed? Okay. Some of it, a tiny amount gets formed when the lead ball hits the ground, a little bit gets scraped off, abraded, 1.5%. Uh, I didn't make this up. Uh, studies looking at uh, shooting ranges, looking at lead contamination in waterways, um, groundwater around modern shooting ranges, estimated 1.5%, not very much. Mostly it's the lead buried in the soil gets transformed into other compounds, okay? Serucite, hydrocerucite, and lead sulfate. In acidic soils, these compounds break down fairly quickly and that lead would get released. Okay? But in Saratoga's Rhinebeck and Hudson silt loams, they're only slightly acidic, 6.1 to 6.5 pH. So those musket balls would have been pretty stable in that soil. Lead, we can all agree, uh, damages human health, but not this lead at this, in this soil at this time. Okay. And then furthermore, even if the lead were released at 119 parts per million, that's still below what the EPA says, Environmental Protection Agency, what it considers as a, as a hazard. EPA said that it's a hazard when there was 400 parts per million of lead in bare soil in children's play areas. Okay. The EPA has shown that much lower concentrations of lead harm different species of plants, uh, birds, mammals, including our old friend, the shrew from Martha's Vineyard. But for now, let's keep the focus on humans. Okay. So given the amount of lead and the type of soil there in at Saratoga, why go to all of this trouble of describing the concentration of lead? Because I think conditions have changed from 1777 to today. Okay. Over the past century, a lot, this is no surprise to you, a lot of fossil fuels have been burned, um, releasing a lot of sulfur dioxide, nitrous, uh, uh, nitrogen oxides and ammonia 
into the atmosphere where it gets turned into sulfuric acid, nitric acid, ammonium, and it falls back to earth as acid rain or snow. At the end of the 20th century, rain in the Adirondack region of upstate New York, which is where Saratoga is, had a pH of 4.5, about 10 times more acidic than background conditions. And those Hudson and Rhinebeck silt loams don't have the limestone deposits that would buffer or neutralize the, ac the acidity. So now, maybe two or a little more than two centuries after Saratoga, maybe that cerussite and hydrocerussite is starting to dissolve. Conditions have also changed because there has been more lead deposited on Saratoga. Americans first started pumping leaded gasoline in 1923. And by 1985, when leaded gasoline was phased out, the estimate is that automobiles released 7 million tons of lead into the atmosphere. Okay. How much of that lead landed on Saratoga? I don't know. But maybe lead deposited from the sky combined with lead in the soil liberated by acid rain might, might be reaching critical concentrations. So environmental history reminds us that during the revolution and today, humans are locked in this intimate relationship with the natural world. The environment shaped the course of the war. We can talk about some of the ways uh, during Q&A. Okay. Uh, and war shaped environmental changes. The war closed the door on some species, like those white oaks. Okay? And it opened it wide for other species, those chestnuts and black oaks. The door opened a crack for those uh, voles and shrews and whales, and then it closed. And maybe in Saratoga, it's starting to open right now. So what I've done here with Saratoga and Martha's Vineyard and Valley Forge could be replicated at dozens of sites in, uh, in the United States or abroad that were connected with the War of Independence. And I think a metabolic and environmental perspective would give us a, a dizzying array of human and human actions and environmental changes. And I think that would produce a rich mosaic that would give us a new complex picture of the American Revolution and its legacies. I'd be happy to talk about all of this and more during question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zoomers. I stay here. So Zoomers, don't be shy in, in asking questions. I'll stay here as long as uh, Andrew runs the, runs the uh, mission control there. But uh, we can start with any, any questions here. Yes, sir. Oh, hold on. Th this way, folks on Zoom can hear you. Being a former resident of Saratoga County. I don't think that's on. No, it is on. Being a former resident of Saratoga County, have you gotten in touch with the county health department to see if they have high levels of lead in yeah. various locations? I have. So the question was, have I been in touch with anyone in Saratoga today? I have not. I did maybe 10 years ago write to the National Historic Park. Could I? like in some you know, out of the way corner, take a, a soil sample. And they said, no. I said like, wear all black and like a ninja and, and get an auger. But they said, you know, it's federal property. And they said, no, you know, um, it would be hard to separate, uh, to, to be able to, um, yeah, I guess control for, what has been deposited since 1777. Like maybe, maybe um, the, the, 
I, I'm saying stuff is coming from the the um, musket balls and uh, deposition from leaded gasoline, but maybe there's other lead there in Saratoga County that some car dealership dumped, and would that mess up the calculations? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Whoa, 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 whoa. With your calculations, uh, we're assuming that all the lead musket balls are dissolving. Uh, I suspect that aren't there isn't a fair amount of the lead still localized in the balls buried wherever. Yeah. Uh, Uh, you raise a question that I hadn't thought about. Uh, acid rain falls. How much? There, there's probably a gradient of acidity in the soil. It's probably the top quarter inch is probably the most acidic. Is it at all more acidic at the bottom of my four inch layer? I don't know. So, yes, I, I, I think there could be balls that. Um, aren't affected by the acid rain. I, I want um, a, a previous a previous speaker uh, at this podium was uh, Kevin Weddle, right? Of the uh, who wrote a terrific has written a terrific book about the Battle of Saratoga, and I need to get in touch with him. Uh, I'm I'm almost a little afraid. What is he going to say when I tell him the battlefield is 253 acres? Is he going to like burst into uh, laughter, or is he going to say, "Right on, man"? Uh, uh, I think I think that is also a um, uh, major um, uh, area in which I might have miscalculated, as well as firing all or 75 percent of the of the musket balls. Okay, Cyberland. So if I a ask every single question, we might be here until midnight. So I might have to pick. I'm, I'm spending the night. They, they are great questions, though. And I apologize to everyone on Zoom if I don't get your, to your question. Um, the first one is, uh, what was the, the impact on the local population uh, at Valley Forge with such a large use of timber? What was the firewood? effect with the on the deforestation? local population yeah. of, of Valley Forge? Um, great question. I think uh, it doesn't seem to be like uh, it was this um, crippling blow the way uh, the carpet bombing of some German cities in World War II led to the, you know, people would have to totally relocate. Uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, people had to find new places to live. Uh, after the, the the army left Valley Forge, um, I remember some accounts talking about, well, we got to rebuild some fences because those got burned during the Valley Forge winter. But they um, uh, they returned uh, some much of the land to to productive agricultural use. Great, thank you. And um, in general, how long does it take the land to recover after env such environmental impacts like this, mm. like you just went over? Jeez. Okay, I I'm a historian, not not a um, ecologist. Uh, I I've read some stuff. I think it depends on um, a lot of things. Um, first. Uh, recover in in what in what sense? Recover to uh, the state of human engineering at the at just prior to the war, like productive farmland. Uh, there are lots of accounts of war in which uh, farms, uh, uh, orchards, cornfields are burned. 
the uh, infamous Sullivan expedition in central New York in 1779. One estimate is that they burned 160,000 bushels of corn, which the, uh, the equivalent would be a, I don't know how many, uh, what the size of the Washington commander's football field is, but let's say um, if you could fit 60,000 people in there, that's the weight of about 160,000 bushels of corn. So there was tremendous destruction, but recovery, I things recover, things start changing the, all the time. As soon as those burned fields, as soon as the fires went out, certain organisms say, hey, this is great. There's not all this corn anymore. I, there's room for me to grow. Every door that closes opens another door for another species. But how soon can they, could the, those Iroquois peoples recover and uh, um, plant fields of corn at, to the extent that they had before, uh, not very quickly. And to dovetail off of that, out of the span of all the battlefields, on the <laughs> which area do you think uh, suffered the most? Hmm. Well, one way uh, humans human presence causes a lot of environmental change. And if, if, hum if there's a battle uh, and it's one day like Lexington or Concord, there's probably not a lot of environmental change. But if there is ongoing presence uh, year after year, I think that would be, I would, I would bet that there would be more environmental change there. So the, the main British army is in New York City from 1776 to the end of the war in 1783. Thousands, thousands of soldiers, and, and as well as women and children, uh, year after year. After, Lex, after uh, Valley Forge, um, the next 78, 79, 80, 81, the winter encampments were uh, scattered, but uh, scattered in um, uh, middle, uh, more um, uh, Jockey Hollow, uh, Morristown, New Jersey, Hudson Highlands, uh, south of West Point, and some places in, um, in Connecticut. And they built the huts the first year, but then they returned to those spots uh, the subsequent years. So there wasn't continuous there wasn't 127,000 trees cut down each time to build the huts, but they had to get firewood. So I think repeated um, um, occupancy in those winter encampments might have led to uh, a lot of environmental change. Great. And it seems like we have a few avid fishermen on here um, because three people asked the same question. Are okay. there any other examples like the whales hmm. of the fish population benefiting from this hmm. or in also we can add negative effects as well. Right, right. There are accounts of, um, of soldiers, both British and German and continental soldiers uh, going after fish in, in rivers to supplement the provisions that weren't necessarily coming in on wagons. Uh, the, the thing, the, the issue about fish that that I'm most interested in is, is not the environmental legacies of the revolution, but how might the revolution have contributed to the coming? How might have how might have the environment com, com, contributed to the coming of the revolution? And I've I've I haven't uh, done a lot of research on this, but um, cod fishing was uh, cod was the main uh, species uh, for for uh, fish 
in the North Atlantic for centuries, from the late 1400s on, as, in, as inshore fishing areas got depleted in the 1700s, fishing boats had to go farther out, uh, take longer fishing voyages in order to get the cod. During the Stamp Act riots, 1765, there, uh, there, were, there were riots and you know, uh, uh, effigies hung in Liberty Trees in Boston. In New York City, there were Stamp Act riots and mariners, sailors, played a leading role in, um, in those riots. So I was, I was thinking, why would, why would sailors, fishermen, uh, be so radical. And uh, there, there are um, political and economic and social and cultural reasons to, uh, that historians have provided. And I was wondering if on those longer fishing voyages, we can't fish close to shore, we got to go hundreds of miles out into the Atlantic, I wondered if those fishermen, those fishers, got more independent. If you're, you're on your own for a longer time, there's no owner of the fishing vessel telling you what to do. And so might they have developed a attitude of independence that then uh, found a, a kind of outlet with the Stamp Act riots? I don't know. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to prove or what kind of evidence I would have for a more independent attitude. Mutinies? Uh, I, I don't know. So if, if you have any ideas, uh, I'm, I am all ears. But, uh, but fish, yes, fish, a vital source of, um, of energy for those soldiers. And uh, alas, I have not uh, looked into specific river or lake ecosystems to see what the effects might have been. Great. Anyone here? Yeah. Car Carl, right? Carl first, and then we'll go. Uh, <clears throat> I know as a, a historians often like to go back in time in the place they study. And so, uh, and, and generally, if you study battlefields or wars, you have to have an area that could support a large population of soldiers over a period of time. And oftentimes when the settlers come in, moving west, they find the best spots to settle in, which have good sources of water, food, game. Oftentimes those areas were heavily populated by the indigenous population. Who were there then? when you studied it, who was left of the indigenous population and how was that used before it was settled? Or I guess there was a settlement before that was displaced. Right, right. So for uh, Pennsylvania, by the, by, the, by the American Revolution, uh, the native population had been largely pushed out. Certainly, certainly in the area like Chester County, Philadelphia, and where um, Valley Forge was, uh, uh, many decades earlier, the, uh, the uh, local population had been displaced. Maybe you've heard of the walking purchase, the, uh, the, uh, 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 a nefarious deal that the Pennsylvania government uh, um, bent to its purposes and uh, and uh, took took land from Delaware Indians, and that was the 1730s, and that's uh, eastern eastern PA. So so uh, by um, by the by the 1770s in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, not really any um, um, sizable per, uh, numbers of of, um, of natives. Martha's Vineyard, 
there is there was some reference to a, a small native population, but uh, I don't remember there them having a uh, a political role in 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 the war. Um, there were uh, John uh, General John Burgoyne, who led the British force and German forces at Saratoga, had uh, natives mostly as guides and scouts, uh, but um, they were a, uh, a a population, a group that their presence uh, was. Sometimes they were there. Sometimes they decided to leave. And they operated for reasons that uh, were in their best interests, not the British or German best interests. And when it wasn't in their interest to uh, to work with Burgoyne, uh, they they left. A terrific book about Native Americans and uh, the American Revolution is Colin Calloway, um, The American Revolution in Indian Country. 1995. Each chapter looks at a different native community and what was the effect of the of the war, like leading up to the war on it, at, during the war and afterwards. Colin Calloway, he's written dozens of books about uh, native peoples and early America. They're all terrific. In uh, your research, have you come across any uh, um, anything about the Oyster Bay population? You know, the oyster population mm. in uh, on, in the Hudson River mm. because of the British occupation mm. of New York during the Revolution. Any? Mm. No, no. That would be an interesting angle. That would too. be. It would be. Um, You know the these uh, mariners uh, were valued for not only their um, ability to handle boats, but also their their knowledge of the the particular geography, this bay, the the uh, at low tide, how what's the clearance for boats, uh, but um, people don't talk about their knowledge necessarily about the the food. And so th that is interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, a terrific book about oysters. That's what you said, right? Oysters is, um, what's her name? American Baroque is the book. And I'll get the author's name to you. It's, it's, it's gone. Molly Warsh, W-A-R-S-H, I think. Uh, I have a two-part question for you. How do you think that you pull in environmentalists and environmental research into your history and your historic findings that are potentially dire? And um, maybe I'm projecting my own dream onto that question. But the second part is, what is your dream outcome of your research and your calling attention to this? Okay. Kat, can you give me question one again? Yeah, how do you pull environmentalists into your research and your findings? Well, uh, so the question: How do I? How do people interested in the environment, in in uh, the natural world, how do they get them interested in history? Okay. Well, I think um, history technically is a, a recorded human action. Okay, and prehistory is human, like human acts, stuff that we don't necessarily have records for. Well, I think the record is pretty clear that humans have had an uh, incredible effect on the natural world. Uh, in our lifetimes, I think it's inescapable. In 250 years ago, I think given the kinds of technology uh, that that were that people had available to them, maybe the effects are are there, there's a, more of a ceiling on the effects, but still there there are effects. So if you are an ornithologist and you are interested in bird migration, well, 
humans have uh, affected bird populations around the world for a zillion years. And so knowing something about uh, you know, like the, the, hum the human motivations for going to the South Pacific, for why they value these kinds of feathers over those kinds of feathers might help, might give ornithologists some kind of understanding of of perhaps um, uh, part of that continuum of how that bird population might have grown and, and shrunk or their territory broadened or, or narrowed. Okay. What do I hope to be the outcome of this? Um, a book, a book uh, during, hopefully, uh, during the 250th anniversary of the revolution, hopefully sooner rather than uh, later, um, I, I, there are two audiences, two main audiences, three audiences, uh, audience of people interested in early America and the revolution, uh, people interested in the environment, and just people interested. Uh, I think this stuff has more to say to folks who are primarily interested in early America. Uh, environmental history has made contributions to early America, but hasn't really uh, uh, gotten a big foothold in the War of Independence. Okay? And I think if I can tell uh, folks uh, who are interested in the environment that important stuff is happening in the late 1700s or important stuff happens with war, and this is just one war of many wars that you could look at, then I'll be happy. Um, I wanted to say thank you. You've gotten me thinking about some different things I've never thought about before. Um, one of those is just in the local area here in DC, we have a lot of Civil War era forts. A lot of the high ground here is either public land or still controlled by the military, which is just mm. interesting that we've lost public access, or I yeah. guess thinking more to Boston, the, the same might be true from the Revolutionary War. And that, it's not really a question, just, you know, thanks for getting me thinking about things. Well, th thank you very much. Um, I think you raised the question of militarized landscapes, what histor some historians call militarized landscape. When you have an army base, a naval shipyard, or whatever, or a battlefield, these are all militarized landscapes. And some, I think uh, some of the things that we see with militarized landscapes is nature doesn't always behave the way we we think it will or want it to. We think that we can, humans generally think they can control nature in predictable and repeatable ways. And nature keeps on proving uh, them wrong. And so, you know, I, I don't know if you are uh, bird feeders, uh, but I try to keep squirrels from eating my bird seed and Squirrels defeat me uh, all the time. Um, uh, militarized landscapes, you, you think uh, we're gonna we're gonna control, we're gonna have these fences, we're gonna we're gonna have borders, we're gonna have uh, razor wire and all that, but uh, nature gets in there. One of the good ways in which war affects nature is demilitarized zones. That area between North and South Korea is one of the great bird habitats uh, in the world because there are no humans there. And when humans mess things up, and when if you get rid of the humans, yeah, there are landmines and there are machine gun turrets and all that. But all these migrating birds come into Korea, and uh, that's 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 not what they expected. So thank you for thank you for coming. Any more? I think we. I'm going to second our last guest's uh, comments and thank you very much for coming out this evening and, and speaking for us. Um, thank you all for attending in person and thank you all at home for attending yes. uh, virtually with us. Um, so we will see you in a couple weeks uh, for David O. Stewart.
So get home safe, and uh, thank you for your continued support of our mission. Thank you, folks.